Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if this works here. Could we have your attention for a moment now? Let us uh, turn now to what might be considered a more traditional form of relief, the labor injunction. In light of the Tomko case, there can be no question uh, of the board's jurisdiction with respect to cease and desist orders. We now have a situation which was uh, most recently exemplified in the Ontario hospital dispute, which um, in which there's concurrent jurisdiction, both in the courts and in the Ontario Labor Relations Board. I'd like to consider the merits uh, of that concurrent jurisdiction, in which uh, disputes are, in effect, being litigated in both forums. In cases where a party has had its case litigated in one forum and failed to obtain injunctive relief, should such a party be precluded from pleading its case in another forum? Discussing generally the question of injunctive relief, I'll turn first to Paul Cavaluso. Just, it's a fairly confusing area because there is concurrent jurisdiction, uh, and it's, it's sometimes difficult to determine which forum to go to. Of course, we're dealing with the Supreme Court of Ontario uh, sitting in weekly court, and uh, the Labor Board under Section 82 of the Act. Now, before we deal with the differences in procedure, I'll deal with it in a minor way, as well as the differences in jurisdiction, uh, it's important to recall that this is a fairly new remedy uh, to the Labor Board. Um, Section 123, which deals, which is the cease and desist order in the construction industry, was just given to the Board in 1970, and of course, in respect of all other industries, uh, the power was given to the Board in 1975. Now, in dealing with the, very brief, briefly with the differences in procedure, first the Labor Board under Section 82. It's my understanding that an application under, 80, under 82, and that in such an application, that the applicant is given a hearing within three to six days uh, from the date of filing the complaint, which is fairly quick. Uh, the case is proven by uh, viva voce evidence, and if the Board issues a direction, of course, we're dealing with unlawful strikes and unlawful lockouts. If the board gives a direction uh, on its own motion, it'll file that order or direction in the Supreme Court of Ontario, and it becomes enforceable as a judgment of the Supreme Court of Ontario. The other form, of course, is the weekly court. Now, the weekly court uh, situation is a little more complex because you're dealing with two kinds of situations. The first is where Section 20 of the Judicature Act applies, and the other situation, of course, is where it doesn't, and the injunction is obtained much easier. Now, Section 20 defines a labor dispute, and in order to get an injunction in any labor dispute, you have to comply with all the conditions of Section 20 of the Judicature Act. There are very stringent procedural restrictions put on the applicant in such applications, and the key one, obviously, is the question of police assistance. In order to get an injunction in a labor dispute, the court must be satisfied uh, that reasonable efforts to obtain police assistance uh, have been unsuccessful. If the applicant can establish that there is no labor dispute, that the applicant is completely divorced uh, from the dispute, uh, then the ordinary principles apply, and it's much easier to obtain. Now, quickly dealing with the difference, differences in jurisdiction. When do you go to the court? When do you go to the labor board? It's a fairly complex area, uh, but I think there are two simple rules that you can keep in mind in attempting to distinguish between the jurisdiction of both bodies. And the first one is that the Labor Relations Board will not restrain picketing in connection with a lawful strike. They clearly said that in the Canteen of Canada case, we will not, we have no remedial authority to deal with picketing if it's in connection with a lawful strike. For example, 
you have a, a lawful strike um, and the picketing is done at the site of the employer, and there's a lot of violence on the picket line, there are other breaches of the peace, etc. The Labor Board will not deal with that picketing. You will have to go to the Supreme Court of Ontario. And of course, you would have to comply with the restrictions of Section 20. Uh, the other general rule or rule of thumb is that the Board will restrain picketing under 82 if it's done in connection with an unlawful strike. So that here's the area, picketing in relation to an unlawful strike. Here's the area where you have concurrent jurisdiction and you're going to have to make the decision as to which form you're going to. And it seems to me that the choice of form uh, will probably depend in most instances on where you feel it will be quickest, you'll get the quickest remedy, and where, you're, where you'll be assured of getting that remedy. And it seems to me that that depends on whether Section 20 applies. If I was the applicant, I've never been an applicant in one of these cases. Um, if Section 20 applied, I would go to the Labor Board. If Section 20 didn't apply, I would go to, I would go to the Supreme Court of Ontario. So that uh, I think that those two general rules are, are important. Another important point for people who practice labor law in Ontario is that in respect of unlawful strikes, you really don't have that problem in the federal sector. The federal court, of a, the federal court has decided that in respect of unlawful strikes, any attempt to restrain that unlawful strike, you'll have to go to the Canada Labor Relations Board. You can no longer go to the federal court so that you really don't have that choice. You do, in respect of picketing, you still go to the federal court, but if you want to restrain the unlawful strike itself, uh, you go to the, the board, the Canada Labor Relations Board. Now, I'd like to very quick, quickly deal with the ho recent hospital dispute, which is a classic case of the interrelationship between the Labor Board, the Supreme Court of Ontario, in the midst of, a of an unlawful strike. Of course, it's a situation where under the legislation, hospital workers are not entitled to strike. What happened in that case is that QP, which was the bargaining agent, threatened an unlawful strike. The hospital association, which was the, the employer for all intents and purposes, filed a Section 82 application. You can go to the board before the strike takes place because the board can deal with threats of unlawful action under 82. The association went to the board under 82. The union moved to the Supreme Court of Ontario to prohibit the board from hearing the case on the basis uh, that Section 82 was unconstitutional, a la Tomko, as, as Sid mentioned, and on the basis that the deprivation of the right to strike is contrary to an international convention. Um, the ILO uh, agreement. The, that application was dismissed fairly quickly. The board proceeded with the hearing of the Section 82 application and that uh, the association was successful. The board issued a direction ordering the officers of CUPE not to prepare for the strike, to inform its employees that it would be unlawful to go on strike, etc., etc. Uh, CUPE defied that direction and lo and behold, on, in the next week, the Attorney General entered the scene, which is very unusual for a labor dispute, but the Attorney General moved for an injunction to stop the strike. The Attorney General was not the employer. It, was, it said it was just attempting to enforce the legislation. Um, the Supreme Court of Ontario granted the application for the injunction of the Attorney General on the basis that there was no labor dispute, and therefore Section 20 didn't apply. I, I have trouble with that judgment. Um, QP defined this, defied this injunction as well. And therefore, what happened then is that the Attorney General moved for contempt of the court's injunction. The Ontario Hospital Association moved for contempt of the, court, of the board's order. See, the board's order is, is filed under Section 83 of the Labor Relations Act by the board on its own motion, and it becomes like a judgment of the court. Now, a very important judgment resulted from the application for contempt of the board's order. That's a judgment of, of Mr. Justice Hughes last week or the week before, where he dismissed the motion of the hospital association on the basis that at the time of the motion, the strike was over and there was nothing left to enforce in respect of the board's order. Of course, the board's order was to 
to ensure that no strike took place. And since the strike was over, Mr. Justice Hughes decided that there was nothing left to enforce and the court had no jurisdiction to do anything. Um, Mr. Justice Hughes, I, the, that judgment is under appeal. I don't know if there are written reasons for that judgment. They haven't been released yet. Well, they haven't been released yet. But I understand that uh, he relied on a, a British Columbia Supreme Court uh, decision called, called All Can Smelters, where the BC Labor Code has a fairly similar uh, provision to 83A, which uh, deals with uh, the filing of board's orders. And uh, in that case, Mr. Justice Hutchison of the Supreme Court of BC said that the role of the court in this kind of problem is to enforce compliance with the board's order. Once compliance is, 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 is met, then the court has no longer any role to play. He basically said that uh, the role of the court is not to punish uh, violations of the board order and uh, dismiss that application as well. Uh, now many people, um, now first of all, uh, it's important to note that this judgment is important in the effect that it will apply now to arbitration awards under 37 to decisions of the board under 79, which are filed in court, decisions of the board under 81, and so on. It goes, it goes far beyond Section 82. Now, some people are concerned uh, with the effect of this judgment. Uh, some people think it will encourage uh, people to defy the law right until the time of the hearing of the motion. Uh, but I, I point out, I, I don't have that fear because I think most people will comply with board, board orders. And moreover, the parties or whoever is defying the order of the board can be prosecuted under the legislation for defying the board order under Section 85. Of course, you would have to get consent to prosecute, uh, but that remedy is, is still there. It's a very important judgment. Um, as I say, it's under appeal at the moment. Uh, finally, in respect of uh, forum shopping, uh, do we have the only system that's viable? And I suggest that we don't. There's another system uh, in British Columbia where most of the power in respect uh, of dealing with injunctions and labor disputes is left with the Labor Relations Board of British Columbia. There we have one body uh, that's primarily responsible uh, for dealing with such uh, situations. The court is only concerned in British Columbia in respect of breaches of the peace and the picket line violence, uh, criminal law violations, and so on. And it seems to me out there in British Columbia the jurisprudence in respect of this kind of problem is mo more coordinated, coherent, and so on. And it seems to me at the present time, uh, under Section 20, we have many irreconcilable decisions from the court. And, and uh, the reason for that is that most of these applications are only heard in the, the, the high court level. They never reach the Court of Appeal, usually. And the other thing is that these matters are heard very quickly in a couple of days. There is an inadequate preparation in terms of the evidence, uh, the argument, and so on. So that. British Columbia has another, another way, and, and in my view, it, that's probably preferable. What, uh, what's the board's uh, authority with respect to contempt, uh, Paul? Well, the board's, uh, it, it depends on, on uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of contempt. My understanding is that if, for example, if, if a witness is in contempt of the board proceeding, that uh, the board, on its own motion or an interested party, may move to the divisional court to enforce any order of the board. In your view, would the board have similar uh, authority in connection with uh, a violation of one of its orders, a cease and desist order in, in particular? In, 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 the, in the hospital case, it was the attorney general who intervened. Let's suppose that one of the parties went back to the board and said that uh, this order is not being complied with. Could the board then refer the matter to the divisional court on a contempt application? I don't, uh, I don't know where the board would have any jurisdiction to deal with that because before you get to the board, you would have to find some mechanism to get there. And I assume that you would try to get there by way of 79. Uh, but 79 only deals with contraventions of the act, not necessarily contraventions of board orders. So I think the board is left in a, in a, perhaps in a, in a quandary there. You have the summary, or not the summary, but the summary conviction procedures of Section 85 that deal specifically with contravention of board orders. But it seems to me that something is going to have to be done because I think the court has taken the view that uh, certainly in their own, if it was their own judgment and the person had complied with the judgment by the t time of the contempt motion, the court would have done something. And I think the court has perhaps correctly taken the view that it's not for us to protect the processes of the board. 
it's for the legislation to confer that kind of power on the board. And, uh, and perhaps that's the answer to the legislative amendment. Don? Well, just picking up on that point, it may be that legislation is required, but one of the time-honored but to lend its enforcement powers to those inferior tribunals so that their awards and decisions are enforced and complied with. And uh, I think there's reason to be concerned in the circumstances that, in the, in the circumstances of the uh, Ontario Hospital dispute. Does, uh, does, it apply, the is, does it apply in any situation other than in a cease and desist order? If it's a monetary award, there's no problem, is there? Well, there, there's no problem with them. I suppose that you ultimately get the point where a seizure, seizure of assets takes same, place. The same as an execution pursuant to a judgment. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically it is. Uh, it's really a question of whether the court will view noncompliance with the board orders as contempt in the same way as it would of its own orders. But if the order has been complied with, at the time the matter comes before the court. Do you, see any, do you see any problem in the court saying at that stage, leave us out of this labor dispute. We're, this is a matter for, for, for the board. Why should we invoke the court's process at that stage to punish someone for having violated the board's order? Well, and, and, and get the, the courts into the area of labor disputes, one which uh, at least some think the court should be out of as much as possible, certainly in that area. Well, as the legislation stands now, it's clearly put into the court's court. Uh, you know, those orders are only enforceable through the Supreme Court of Ontario, and it ought not to stand back, it seems to me, and say, oh, we don't want to get into these things. Uh, no, I'm, t I'm saying that the dispute is over. The dispute's over. But it shouldn't be any different, at the very least, than the approach the court takes to a breach of its own injunction in a labor dispute. And there, the court doesn't say we have no jurisdiction to uh, uh, punish for contempt. They will weigh the circumstances and make a judgment in each case as to whether it's appropriate. Well, well uh, the language of the act is a little unusual because it's true that the only way that the order can be enforced is by the court. Nevertheless, the language says that the the direction shall be entered in the same way as a judgment or order of that court and is enforceable as such. Now, perhaps the position is that uh, giving this language a fair interpretation, there's nothing to enforce once the judgment or direction has been complied with. And one is no longer enforcing a judgment, but rather punishing its contempt. And perhaps the remedy does lie with the legislature. I'd like to make a brief comment about a couple of things that Paul said. Um, I, I think that there is an attitude on the part of judges to resist the temptation to get involved in labor disputes. And I think, therefore, that in some of these areas of concurrent jurisdiction, that we may find that judges are going to refuse to grant an injunction in a labor dispute when there is concurrent jurisdiction in the board. After all, we don't have a right to an injunction. It's a discretionary remedy. And perhaps one day the argument will succeed that says, yes, there's concurrent jurisdiction, but the legislature established the board as a board having expertise and perhaps broader feeling and knowledge for the problem. And therefore, you should be going there, at least insofar as that board has jurisdiction to resolve the matter. And the second question that's raised is that one of the problems in going to court for an injunction is the, the question of, uh, of finding a party and properly identifying the party, the defendants. In other words, you, you can't see a, sue a union, you sue people. Now, that frequently raises a question of identifying people on the picket line and the problem of immediately get, having photographs taken. There's a risk that the board may decide that the photographing of people on a picket line during the course of a lawful strike is a form of intimidation and, is, and will be taken as evidence later that can be used to support an order 
under Section 79, so that uh, there's a risk in, involved in overdoing the matter of gathering evidence, taking photographs, and doing so in a public way. Chris? These people, I mean, these are the only sections in favor of management, you know, 82 and 123. And all of a sudden now, uh, the court shouldn't act. Uh, I mean, there is a, we have a real fear. You can tell Paul has never acted for an applicant under 82 or 123. We have a real fear with this recent judgment because what will happen is that the strike will continue, notwithstanding the cease and desist, until, until 9.30, the morning the court's going to hear it at 10 for contempt. And, and I mean, that is a real fear, and we, from our experience, the, many unions will go as far as they can, and that means time-wise. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that uh, on appeal that that uh, judgment will be dealt with in accordance with justice. Uh, and, uh, from our point of view, and, uh, but no, it's it's a it's it's a very serious problem. On time, I, I have good news. Uh, the board this week, we filed a 123 at 11 o'clock, 11:30 on Monday, and we got a hearing at one o'clock on Tuesday. So we're uh, starting at least to make some impression over there on one aspect of the act, and. Uh, and so it is that fast now. We can get it within 24 hours. Uh, and the hearing was called, I think, by telephone and by telex, so that uh, we're making some progress in, in that way. Now, if, if we, as I say, if, if the order is enforceable uh, by, by way of a contempt proceeding, then I think that probably uh, going to court would only, you'd only benefit by going on, say, secondary picketing. And, and secondary picketing is the one area where uh, you would have to go to court uh, to get relief, and you can go ex parte on that, or at least uh, we have done it by a phone call to the union's office to say that we were going to make a motion in court uh, uh, at 1 o'clock this afternoon, and, and uh, in that type of case, it's, it's wise still to go to the courts. If the only thing you're seeking is contempt, why don't you move under Section 85 to prosecute the individuals who violated or, ale or alleged to have violated the board's order? That, that section is, is, uh, has never been worthwhile. We, we, have, uh, we have about 10,000 consents in our office, and we, I don't think, have proceeded on any of them. Uh, because it's just uh, you, have to, you have to pay for the costs of, of prosecuting, and once they're fined, you don't collect the fine for your client that goes into the Treasury. And uh, so your clients not, are not going to spend thousands of dollars to prosecute someone when it's not recoverable. Well, you're not going to collect any money on a contempt application either. No, it's but punishment it's... punishment the name of the game. No, but cont uh, contempt, I mean, the only reason you do it is not really to punish, but to give strength to the order of the board for the future. I mean, we're not out to punish anyone. We just want an order of the board to be acknowledged with the same effect as a Supreme Court judgment so that they can't ignore the order for three or four days until the matter is dealt with. Because, you know, many illegal strikes are costing employers thousands of dollars per day. We had one situation where we got a, a next party where it was costing at least $50,000 a day with a chance of loss of customers because it was a retail operation. And, and so if these, if these orders of the board are not given the same strength uh, as a judgment of the court, we're going to be in terrible shape. You want the last word on this, Paul? Just, just an interesting comment here. Uh, <laughs> if, if Bruce is saying that by going for contempt that your purpose is not to punish, then it seems to me that the board in Kmart uh, issued compensatory damages. It was not trying to punish uh, the employer in that case. It was just trying to do what Bruce would be trying to do in a contempt application, and that is to enforce the legislation and make sure it's effective. Well, it is a little different there, I mean. <laughs> We're talking about the enforcement of board order, not the legislation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, there are a number of other questions I have on this uh, uh, series of questions that were handed to us by your committee. But rather than deal with them, I propose now, with the re time remaining to us, to call for questions from the floor, see what the issues are that may have arisen either out of what was said here this morning or, or earlier. And uh, we'll be glad to have members of the panel try to deal with them uh, as best they can, uh, if you'd put the questions to us. Yes.
Well, I mean, the person's rights uh, to engage in whatever activity they were engaging in, in, those rights were determined by the board at a proper hearing before they issued the order. And in effect, they have, they have heard uh, uh, full evidence uh, uh, as to the activity of the individual or the union or the employer, and they've made a determination. Then the next question is, what happens when the person ignores that determination? And surely that is properly a matter for a, for a summary applica application. It's not really a question of rights at that point. It's a question of violating a direct order once a person's evidence, uh, once all the evidence has been heard. I think there's nothing also to prevent a full hearing, and a full hearing would probably likely follow where there are contested facts. That is, a hearing on contempt need not be one uh, simply uh, to be dealt with by affidavit evidence. Pilko is probably the best example of that, and that was a case in which there was a full hearing. I've seen the material on the Ontario Hospital dispute. It came before me, and I noticed that there, was a no, there were no affidavits put in there. There was a statement of what the allegations are, so I assume that a, a hearing will be asked for in, in that case in order to deal with the contempt issue. So while there may not be a preliminary hearing, at least the, uh, the persons uh, charged with contempt are going to have the case against them presented before they're called upon and given the full opportunity to reply in defense. Are there any other questions there? Yes. Well, what's your answer to your friend's question, Mayor? Well, he's one of our favorite respondents.
more properly, uh, uh, perhaps not a question of fairness, but it's a question of um, uh, the procedures that have been adopted. And I take it the objection now is that the board is moving too quickly. I don't think they're moving quickly enough. Our hope is before uh, June to have that one o'clock move to 930. <laughs> it's sometimes now it's quicker to get into the labor board uh, than it is into court, and that it causes real problems for a labor lawyer in, in terms of preparation because you're usually talking to witnesses during the hearing as, as the hearing is going on. It makes it very, very difficult. But what I think the board should do, if it's going to have uh, uh, quick hearings, and, and uh, obviously there's a problem, and the problem has to be dealt with, and I'm not adverse to having uh, quick hearings, but what I think the board should be more effective in is in terms of trying to settle the matter. Uh, it seems to me that in British Columbia, the board out there takes a far more active role in setting out a, uh, sending out a settlement officer, trying to resolve the problem. You don't have to have lawyers involved, in, and in most instances, it's more effective if you don't have lawyers involved. But get a settlement officer out there, get the parties together, try and resolve the dispute, and the hearing date is sometimes a, uh, an encouragement to the parties to have the matter resolved by the time of the hearing. So that I think if the board is going to play this kind of role, which it's obviously undertaking, then it should be more effective in terms of trying to settle the problem uh, prior, to the, prior to the hearing date. The um, Tomko case is the last case I argued in the Supreme Court of Canada, and I recall that in, in that case there was a complaint uh, of an unlawful strike. The board appointed an investiga uh, investigating officer. He called up the business agent on the telephone, asked him if the men were still picketing uh, this particular plant. He informed him of the complaint, uh, of course, and uh, he said that there was going to be an application that they'd be directed to return to work. He then called up uh, uh, the chairman of the board, who contacted the other members of the board, and within half a day, with the various telephone conversations around Cape Breton, uh, they uh, issued the cease and desist order. I argued that there had been a denial of natural justice in that case, but didn't get anywhere in the, in the Supreme Court of Canada or anywhere else on, on, on that argument. Uh, so that uh, I think that uh, the cease and desist applications if brought before the board can be, will be dealt with far more expeditiously than applications before a court. Yes, uh, Stephen. Well, it's always a compromise, uh, Stephen. If there's going to be fast remedy, some shortcuts have to be taken. And, uh, I suppose that's where the role of council is most important. The board's got to be able to rely upon uh, the council appearing before it, uh, fairly and accurately stating the facts in these summary applications, and it tries to do so. Perhaps that's the philosophy behind the legislation.
maybe the board is uh, more aware of what in fact is going on than a court can uh, assume itself to be. Claude? I'd just like to make a comment, going back to what, uh, what our friend from the union suggested. That raises a question that, in my view, really comes back to the function of the Labor Relations Board. The board does not have the same kind of duty that perhaps a judge might feel it has if, if, if the company is coming forward saying, well, the union is breaking the law in this area. And the union's answer is, well, maybe we are. But we are because the people are frustrated because the company is ignoring the collective agreement in that area and arbitration is too slow. Won't you do something to help us? The board has the power to do something to help you. It is not bound by the same strict rules of let's get on with the case as a judge might feel. So I don't think that it's necessarily fair to blame my friend who acts for the company when perhaps the machinery is there that the union should be perhaps asking for the relief that it seems to me this legislation is intended to give. percent of all applications under 82 and 123 are for blatant violations of the act illegal strikes without any doubt at all first of all <laughs> secondly in answer to your to your second point that's the same order that the courts used to uh, issue in the old injunction cases and it's perfectly proper once the illegal activity is is proven that anybody else who seeks to carry it out should also be stopped from doing so so I think it's a proper form for the order. Just a, a brief comment. It is true that the injunctions issued by courts will have the same kind of, of wording. Uh, it hasn't been accepted, uh, as, as Bruce would seem to suggest. Uh, many people have argued that it's completely unfair. For example, uh, if somebody hasn't been represented at the court injunction to be bound by that kind of, of contempt, but it, of contempt order, or injunction order. Uh, but it seems to me that realistically, uh, in order to prohibit the illegal activity, uh, that you have to have some kind of, uh, of order like that. Otherwise, you're going to stop two people from doing it, and then uh, uh, two other people are going to do it, and then you're going to have to go back to the board and so on and so forth. So that it, it seems to me that it's an effective mechanism in order to. But at the same time, I'm suggesting that the board should be involved in attempting to deal with the real problem. And uh, as you know, an unlawful strike is usually a manifestation of what the real problem is. I'll, I'll take one more question back there.
I, th I think perhaps we can continue this discussion over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.